Hi, welcome and thank you for joining our webinar on Faster Build, Healthier Code and Embedded Continuous Integration. My name is Bruno Casalucci and I'm a field application engineer at ARM. And I'm Zach Lashik, a senior solutions designer at ARM. We will be discussing embedded continuous integration today. First, we will have a look uh, in, in an introduction to continuous integration, and then we will look at some ARM tools that can help you on that environment. And by the end, we will explore two different example scenarios for embedded continuous integration flows. Embedded products are getting more complex from both hardware and software standpoints. There are more lines of code than ever on all embedded applications. For example, on automotive, the number of lines of codes in a luxury car is projected to triple with level three ADAS. More lines of code means more bugs, more maintenance. In the other hand, there has never been so much pressure for products to go to market faster. The software development cycle time has to reduce despite the new complexities. Better time to market means better time to have new, better chance for increased, mar increased market share. For many markets, the requirements for functional safety are getting more strict. This increases development complexity considerably and requires additional uh, time for testing and certification. The traditional methodology of embedded software development is then being challenged and new techniques like continuous integration are playing a crucial role in adapting to those new changes. Before we go into more details of continuous integration, let's look at some of the differences and challenges for embedded software development in general. An embedded project may consist of several devices. As an example, a car, which uh, contain a number of embedded systems uh, with very different tasks and applications. Some may be running complex Linux-based distributions, while others will run RTOS or bare metal firmware with functional safety requirements. Most continuous integration platforms and related tools are available uh, for uh, general purpose software development. They often need to be adapted or expanded to enable its usage on embedded applications. The embedded continuous integration uh, use case will bring a number of complexities, most of them related to how to perform automated testing on embedded hardware targets, and also how to integrate all of the different pieces together. Here are some of these uh, points that bring the extra com complexity. It may be harder on embedded to create a consistent environment as some of the developers may need to work with multiple portions of software and each one might have a different tool configuration requirement. The company might need to invest on a board farm and maintain that board farm, which may be very costly. Moreover, testing software on the hardware targets is also normally slower. Integrating all of the specific tools and processes for each of the subsystem into the CI flow may be complicated as well. In this presentation today, we aim to present some strategies that can address some of these common issues. We also introduce how the ARM tools could be integrated into a continuous integration flow and present you with some example flows that could be used as a reference starting point to set up your own flows. Let's now imagine one scenario where an embedded software company is working on their, on their next product release. Their software has several components, each being developed by a small team of developers. For various regions, reasons, including late hardware uh, availability and uh, the development schedule is not on track. Developers, they try to commit to main software range as, of, as often as possible, but due to time pressures, they only have time to implement new features. They do some unit testing individually, but they don't have time to work on merging to the main line as often. Some weeks before release date, they go into feature freeze and start to integrate all the pieces together. There are differences on local branches and some merge conflicts have to be debugged. But with so many bugs and conflicts, debugging is harder. Moreover, once the software was delivered, some bugs, bugs are reported by the end customer. 
For their next project, they will need to change for a more efficient development flow, one that allows them to find and correct bugs much earlier, not in the field. They want to be confident with their code quality and would like to uh, already have a working deliverable image weeks before delivery target date. Continuous integration is already being used by a number of companies uh, for embedded applications, as it creates a more efficient process with higher speed, quality, and lower costs. One of the main principles of CI is that uh, the developer needs to make small changes to their code and very often commit them, and those will constantly be tested and integrated. This increases the code quality by finding bugs earlier and truly testing for bugs by running a variety of tests. The feedback of that is fast, ideally within minutes, and because only a small portion of code was changed, the developer will be able to quickly fix bugs. Developers now spend less time debugging and running tests, so the delivery of software features will likely be faster. CI can reduce costs in mid and long term. As an example, I would ask you, what is the cost of finding a bug in production? Much company, companies have, been, have decided to implement continuous integration for safety certified software development flows. The use of continuous integration greatly improves quality and higher quality also means lower risk. Functional safety is all about reducing the risk of a fault happening. Also, functional safety requires uh, gathering of testing evidence documentation and since testing is automated with continuous integration this process gets simpler zach will now go into more details about continuous integration and then i'll come back to discuss further uh, how the arm tools can be integrated into the flow into the continuous integration flow over to you zach all right thank you bruno so before we dive into uh, the specifics of what CI is, um, I find it helpful to compare a CI development flow with a more traditional flow, uh, as Bruno was talking about earlier, which we've dubbed the desktop development. Um, so in this desktop envelop development workflow, a team of developers would commit their code once a day as much as possible but once or a couple times per day um, and send it through first before committing it some suite of tests and local builds and tests that they have individually to make sure that their components are working properly and then share their code with the rest of their team at the end of the day so that can be shown illustrated in this sort of a graph here but that leads to many of the problems that bruno was talking about previously Merge conflicts between developers with large differences between their code. Um, issues in the code quality as the tests and the builds are not standardized. Uh, so they could be pushing up uh, broken code that they don't realize is broken. And you also have scalability problems. Um, if you have desktop development, typically all the tools for each developer are local to that person's desktop so they would have each one board one debugger one compiler etc uh, which can certainly lead to some scaling problems as you try to have more robust teams and larger amounts of tests in the ci development uh, much to its contrast instead of committing once per day developers commit many many times a day um, so this helps keep developers in sync with the code that they're sharing as well as help identify issues very quickly. So the more you commit code, each time that you submit uh, a code commit, uh, an automated process would be kicked off to give engineers instant feedback if something is broken or if everything is working appropriately. And that's what this CI development workflow is intended to convey, that you have a lot of commits per day, say 10 of them per developer, which are all committed to a shared repository, which kicked off this automated loop of shared builds, shared test suites, and then shared metrics with this code coverage at the end that all developers share amongst the team. So it's more robust testing and more robust feedback for the entire team to benefit from. 
And before we get into some specifics as well, I'd like to clarify a couple terms that are related to continuous integration, just for, for clarity. So continuous integration here on the left is this practice where developers integrate code into the shared repository several times a day, undergoing automatic building and testing. And what that boils down to essentially is that you commit code often uh, and it's other software is automatically verified to be good or not good. And this gives you the rapid feedback, quality code, and enables faster development as uh, Bruno was mentioning for the benefits of using continuous integration. Another term that's closely related but different is this con concept of continuous delivery. So continuous delivery at its core is really about packaging up the results of continuous integration uh, into a deployment ready state. So your code is always ready for production and then it's already been packaged up into whatever form that means, whether it's an, it's an executable, whether it's a Docker container, whether it's an environment, et cetera. Continuous deployment, uh, the very end of the spectrum, that's the process of actually shipping your code, shipping your program out to wherever it's being deployed. Um, so customers are always using most recent working code. And it's a lot less common for embedded developers to be using continuous deployment, at least today, as it's a lot more complex and use case specific than, say, a website, where it's much more straightforward to just push the latest changes into your development or your production server. Um, in the embedded space, it's more complicated with a lot more devices on a distributed network which may or may not be connected, uh, the processes for updating are a lot more complex. So largely, uh, CI and CD, being continuous integration and continuous delivery, are the aspects that are focused on uh, and embedded. So now we'll go through expanding a bit more on what these, these terms mean in practice. So you have your, your coding over there in gray, you have your CI building and testing in green, your continuous uh, delivery in blue, and your continuous deployment in orange there. So at the highest level, uh, decently straightforward still, where you have developers that code, you have a CI framework where there's builds and tests that verify the software, uh, once that's done, then it's optionally packaged up into deployment-ready format, and then optionally deployed into production. Adding a little bit more detail, you still have your developer who codes, and then you have a lot of specific types of builds and tests under the CI framework. You have these unit tests, integration tests, system tests, uh, and then for the production builds and user tests are some additional ways that you can package up your application as well as deploying. So for the CI specific part here, the unit tests, integration tests, and system tests, those are just common test names that we give um, to help organize the testing uh, structure. So on the left, the unit testing is all about testing the very building blocks of code. So this could be functions, uh, this could be specific lines of code that you want to verify work. Um, and these could, there could be a lot of building blocks in any given piece of code. So these tests are the most common just by number and volume. So this could be anywhere from hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands, depending on the size of your test of your software application. The next level of abstraction is integration testing. So these test how functions work together and interact together, for example, that they're communicating properly. And this still has quite a large number of tests, maybe a thousand, a um, hundred to a thousand, again, depending a lot on the size of your software in the first place. The latter two, functional testing and system testing, these are the higher level tests, which just verify that some certain functionality exists or that the software is meeting some requirements that were set out ahead of time. These have a smaller number of tests and they're more about verifying the entire system's behavior. And 
the type, how you verify these types of tests or how you run them on different development platforms varies substantially just based on what you're trying to accomplish. So for the unit testing and integration testing, you want platforms that support a very high number of tests all being accurate, but you don't need your exact representation of your end system since you're only testing partial components of your software. So you only need to have a, a certain amount of system representation in your development platform. So for this type of use cases, things like virtual platforms are extremely useful in that they're functionally accurate versions of the system that you're trying to verify is working properly. And it's a lot more scalable since they're based in software. And Bruno uh, will be going over exactly what these are in practice a little bit later in the presentation. For functional testing and system testing, this is focused more around uh, hardware development platforms, FPGAs, um, actual hardware development boards, things like that, which are accurate to timing and are more uh, complete versions of your final system where you're testing the full function or the full system's performance. So with that explanation of the specific CI types of testing out of the way, we can expand a bit more on our framework here. Uh, so CI, you have those still builds and tests, but you we've added the different type of uh, code repository branches that are available as well. So you can have a whole lot of different versioning schemes and branching schemes. Um, there's a lot of different types and many of them work uh, for each particular company. Um, there's a lot of things that do work, um, but there's a lot of different possibilities, such as branches for code that passes each slate of tests. So a unit testing branch, integration testing branch, system testing branch, et cetera, as well as individual user branches, feature branches, things like that. But at the end of the day, a core component of a CI flow is that you always have a working production branch or mainline branch or, or something to do with uh, a trunk branch, uh, some name like that. And this is a branch that's always in a working state and is usable um, for these continuous deliveries. So for the production builds, it just builds the production branch, which has been verified, again, to be in a working state with the updated code. And that packages it up into a specific application or environment that's ready for deployment. And then optionally, again, the continuous deployment would be to push that down onto each individual device. So taking that diagram and superimposing the tools that'll help you get there results in a, a certainly a more complicated but complete diagram. So from the top down, uh, we can go through the tools listed. Um, at the very top is some options for your source control, your repository, like GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, CodeCommit. Chances are your organization already has something that works for you and is compatible with the CI master. Next up is the CI master, the framework that runs all of these builds and these tests and organizes them. That can include Jenkins, Bamboo, Circle CI. There's many options here as well, from open source to proprietary. Next up is the compiler that's used to build the test software for these various tests. That can include things like ARM Compiler 6 or the open source GCC. After that is what the tests are run on, the specific development platform. And here we have these ARM FVP models, ARM FAST models, which Bruno will talk about later in the presentation. Things like Docker containers, virtual machines, and of course, hardware boards, development platforms, and uh, FPGAs are all options to run your tests on. Next up is the testing frameworks that are available. And there's dozens and hundreds of these, but two, two Ones that we see frequently being used are Google Test and Unity as testing frameworks. And then for lastly, you have the debugger, the IDE, and the debug hardware that allows you to connect up your um, development platforms to your IDE and your 
debug platform. So you have ARM Development Studio, Kyle MDK, DStream, and Ulang, all of which will be covered a bit later. Um, for the deployment side of things, there's a lot of very specific options. You can build something in-house that works for you. You can leverage Docker pushing images back and forth if you're using uh, a more intensive OS for an application, or ARM Pelion, which provides many options for deployment as well. So as a summary of specifically ARM tools that are available to help out with these continuous integration flows, you have the compiler, which is the best in class C and C++ compiler for ARM platforms. Our virtual platforms, which is ARM fast models and these fixed virtual platforms. And then you have your IDEs, debuggers and debug probes, including Development Studio, Kyle MDK and the various debug probes underneath them. So to talk about these in a bit more detail, I'll hand it back over to Bruno. Bruno? Thank you, Zach. So we will now explore the main benefits of each ARM tool mentioned on the previous slide in more details. Uh, and we'll also focus on the continuous integration um, features of those tools. When building a continuous integration build, test, and integration flow, the compiler is certainly one of the key components. There are a variety of great compilers uh, compatible with ARM cores, as Zach mentioned. Today, I will focus on the embedded ARM compiler provided by ARM, which has been developed and optimized for more than 12, 20 years. The ARM compiler is already being used by many partners for bare metal and RTOS applications running on ARM-based SOCs. It comes integrated with our optimized C and C++ libraries, including the space-constrained micro-C library. Additionally, the linker time optimization features provides further optimization to achieve the best speed and or code size performance. The compiler is suitable for usage in functional safety applications with any safety integrity level for automotive, industrial, railway, and medical applications. The compiler is also very scalable. It is proven to run within containers, as there is already a number of customers making use of this technology. The ARM compiler is available within the ARM integrated development environments ARMDS and CAIO, which will be covered on the next slides. Oftentimes, executing all tests based on the hardware targets can be a challenge. ARMFast models enables that some of those tests can be executed on software-based models. The software-based models are often called virtual platforms or virtual prototypes. These are models of the system on chip that enable software development and debug without the need of a hardware. ARM fast models are 100% behaviorally accurate to the ARM course, meaning the software running on top of a fast model is expected to have the same result as when running on a hardware target. While virtual prototypes may not be available for all of the shelf SOCs, ARM makes available a number of reference virtual prototypes called FVPs or fixed virtual prototypes, which are fixed versions of virtual platforms based on fast models. While these will not have the same memory map or peripheral IP configuration as the off-the-shelf devices, but they also could, in some cases, be used for some level of unit testing. In general, using ARM fast models, enable virtual prototypes will provide these key features. They are very debuggable, either via graphical interface or from the command line for CI flows. They have thousands of trace source events available on each model, enabling deep understanding of the runtime behavior. The execution and control of fast models are scriptable, making them very suitable for CI servers. And one of the key features it is very easy to instantiate multiple virtual prototypes on the same server, allowing for multiple parallel testing. But 
where to perform unit and integration testing. This is a common discussion point when talking about continuous integration. This slide looks at the various available solutions for embedded software testing. From running unit testing on native x86 hosts, which is, by the way, a very common technique, up to running it on a hardware board, either on a development FPGA or final target board. The three options on the right here use hardware boards. The final hardware is normally available only in a later stage of development. Additionally, all types of boards have to be sourced and that may be expensive. This and other reasons make hardware-based testing a challenge, especially when needing to scale for a bigger number of tests. In the other end, on the left, we have an uh, option of running your test natively, in other words, on an x86 host. This test will not be accurate in terms of the architecture, hence any architecture dependent bugs will have different results. Additionally, you will also require to use two different compilers, one for the host and one for the target, may, uh, meaning that you may run into compiler dependence differences as well. Test models enables uh, uh, the best of both of these words for integration and unit testing and can deliver the features that were discussed in the last slide. They are also available very early and uh, they are functionally accurate to the SOC behavior. In the same way that developers need to use a debugger IDE to load their application, connect and debug a board, the ARM debug tools can also be used to perform the same features, but via command line that then can be integrated into a continuous integration flow. This means that the continuous integration server would be able to connect to a hardware board, perform all tests, extract the necessary information, and then take decisions such as if a test failed or passed, or if there was a regression in the performance, for example. Let's first look in more details at ARM DS, and then we'll look at ARM CAIO MDK. ARM DS has an, has an Eclipse-based GUI, but most of its features can also be used from the command line. ARM DS allows debugging of any ARM core enabled target with virtually any number of cores, including heterogeneous devices that have different types of ARM cores. For example, a device could have a Cortex-A cores running Linux and other cores running bare metal applications, all being debugged at the same time, allowing you to debug the dynamic behavior of your code. ArmDS, along with DStream Debug Probe, enables remote connection and debug of a target, meaning that the target can be hosted in the network and then can be shared among developers and the CI server. For the harder to find bugs, device trace may be necessary. The DStream probe integrated trace buffer and streaming uh, trace capabilities allow the capture of a longer execution history, both with the GUI or also from the command line, meaning that you can track down bugs with longer execution trace. ArmDS also contains an application aware profiler called Streamline, which can also be used from the command line. The ARM Graphical Analyzer allows for a deep visualization and debug of GPU-accelerated graphical applications. For Android application development, ARM Mobile Studio provides an integrated tool suite with automatic report generation to ease the process to find performance issues. ARM Mobile Studio could also be integrated into CI flow, allowing for easier regression testing. Kaio MDK is a fully featured development environment for Cortex-M enabled devices. Via the CMC specs, MDK has support for more than 6,000 off-the-shelf SOCs. Kaio MDK also supports that the majority of the EIDE operations can be performed from the command line. You can connect to Kaio running in a remote server and connect to a, bo bo a board that is connected in that server as well. Let's also see some additional differentiating features. Kaio MDK is a comprehensive software development solution for ARM-based microcontrollers and includes all the components that you need to create, build, and debug embedded applications. Software packs add device support and software components that you can use uh, as building blocks for your application. 
They may be added at any time, making new device support and middleware update independent from the toolchain. They contain device support, libraries, middleware, board support, code templates, and many example projects. MDK middleware software components are specifically designed for communication peripherals in microcontrollers. For example, the new IPv6 and IPv4 networking communication stack is now extended with ARM embed software components to enable Internet of Things applications. ARM Kyo also integrates a code covert feature, which is a technique that uses device trace to identify the percentage of code that has been tested. This feature is completely scriptable, is scriptable making it very uh, suitable for an automated flow. Code coverage is fundamental for functional safety certifications as well. Another feature is event statistics, which allow the application to be annotated so that critical runtime inf information is v easily visualized. For example, the minimum, maximum, and average execution time of a critical function. Zach will now explore practical examples of embedded continuous integration flow scenarios. So over to you now, Zach. Thanks, Bruno. Uh, I am an engineering by trade, or engineer by trade. So I like uh, learning by example and doing by example. So at the, to sort of sum up uh, talking about all of these tools and flows, I find it helpful to see what that actually looks like uh, in practice. So what I've done here is specify two different types of companies. And we'll quickly walk through what CI flows look like for both of them, how they're similar and how they're different. So these are two companies, company A and company M. Company A is in the industrial IoT space. You could say they're making a rich IoT product to monitor and manage industrial machines. They're using a Cortex-A processor from ARM and they're running a Python application on top of uh, embedded Linux. This contrasts heavily to company M, which is in the very low power IoT space. They're working in the home sector. So they're developing this smart light device to match the room color to people's moods. And they're using this ARM Cortex-M processor and they're developing a bare metal C application. So there's no OS, no software stacks, just their own custom C components. And these companies I should note are fictitious and they're not taken from uh, any specific customers they have, but they are very indicative of customers that we have and their flows are at a high level the same. So for the CI environment, uh, as discussed before, it essentially breaks down to developing code, building tests, and testing uh, in a lot of different unit tests, integration tests, system tests, et cetera. So for each of these companies, company A and company M, they're both going to be developing, building, and testing. But the specifics of how they do that are going to be quite different. So for company A, uh, for developing their code, since they're using a Cortex-A based processor, the IDE ARM Development Studio makes the most sense for them. So they have one for every engineer on their team. To build for their tests, and this could be building for their unit, unit testing, integration tests, system tests, any, any test that they have, uh, their build farm is comprised of many uh, ARM compiler uh, sixes, environments with ARM compiler six. And the more compilers that they have, the more they're able to par parallelize their building capabilities. So if they have a hundred things, hundred software tests that they need to test, they need to build a hundred applications. And so if you have 10 ARM compilers running in parallel, it'll take you 10 times less time to do that 
than if you only had one. So it's very easy to scale up um, your build farms and reduce your time that it takes to build by increasing the amount of compilers that you have. So for company M, for the develop and build steps, uh, for developing, they're using a Cortex M processor and they've decided that ARM Kyle MDK toolchain makes more sense for them, for their IDE, which works just fine. And then as they move on to their building step, their build farm, uh, now it's for this bare metal application as opposed to Linux, but in both cases, um, it'll work great for this ARM compiler six to be used. The main differences come into play where it's the testing frameworks. So for unit tests and system tests, here it's simplified into just those two buckets, uh, as there can be many shades of what development platforms make the most sense for specifically unit integration, functional tests, spoke tests, system tests. Um, but we'll focus specifically on these two ends of the extreme, unit testing and system testing. So for unit testing for company A, um, they're using, they're leveraging a isolated processes like Docker containers. So they're able using Linux um, to very easily and concisely um, replicate what they're using, uh, their Linux program onto these Docker containers. So there's no need to use a development platform as for their unit testing as their server the linux that's or the in their server running linux it's a lot easier to test their application on it and so they isolate their processes using these docker containers and they're able to scale that up very easily for system tests they'd like a more accurate hardware representation much closer to the hardware of what they're actually going to be using if they want to verify that some inputs and outputs are working as appropriate, et cetera, the timing is more accurate. Uh, so they move over to a hardware board. In this case, if they were leveraging a Cortex A53, then a Raspberry Pi 3 board might make sense. If they're using a higher level A, maybe a Raspberry Pi 4 board makes sense, or dozens of other development boards in the ecosystem are also available. And this contrasts heavily with how court, the company M decides to go about things. So for their unit testing framework, because they're in the, embed, the, the low power embedded space, they're just using C and bare metal C. So it's a lot harder to replicate that environment on a server that's just running Linux. You need to somehow um, get the behavior of your embedded ARM target without the, the need to scale up dozens and dozens of tests on hardware boards. So as Bruno walked through, this is a great use case for ARM fast models to be leveraged in. Uh, so you can deploy lots of these simulations in parallel, similar to Docker containers on your server, and it will replicate the behavior of your software as it will run. Um, so very, very helpful for unit tests and integration tests. For system tests, um, for company M, they would like a development board that's based in Cortex M space. Again, a lot of options, depends heavily on what your actual processor or um, development board and end product look like. But for company M, is in this example, they're leveraging a Muska B development platform. So here is an example view of what a Jenkins CI implementation of those builds and tests would actually look like. Um, so here I've, I've created an example and I'll walk you through a bit more in the next slide of what the pipeline looks like and give you a link to it so you can check this out yourself. But I've implemented both the builds and the tests for both of those company A and company M use cases. And he, this is the manager view for that in implementation. So you can see the various test results graph on the right there, which is counting the number of test fails in red, 
the number of test skips in yellow and the test pass in blue. Uh, so very helpful for a quick understanding of where your tests are, and you can click into that and get more details on anything in particular. Um, and it's, there's also a lot of potential to expand this. So there's graphs for code coverage on Jenkins where you can specifically analyze um, your, your MCDC coverage, branch coverage, et cetera, and how that's increasing or decreasing as you go throughout your development pipeline. Very helpful to get a visual understanding of where your code health is at. And it gives engineers a quick understanding of if their latest pushes, their latest code commits are passing everything or if there's a specific error and how they can go fix it. So here's the example pipeline of what we walked through previously, uh, both being built there for the bare metal and Linux case, but the tests diverge from being run in a Docker container for company A and on ARM fast models for company M. And that's the split there. You can see a little snippet of the bare metal testing stage in the pipeline on the right. And all of this is available for you to check out as well on that GitHub link for reference. Um, so you can check that out and give it a try for yourself. So some additional resources. Um, this slide is about that particular CI implementation example. Um, you can check out that link. Um, and also included in there is the ARM compiler, the ARM fast models, and it leverages uh, the Unity testing framework. Um, so it's it's an e it's a can be used as a reference system or at least a starting point uh, to bring these ideas into what this looks like in practice. Beyond that example, uh, we have quite a few resources just to check out, get more information, learn about specifics uh, around all of these different tools, around things that you need to know, uh, and tools in particular. So on the left you have links to the, all the particular um, tools themselves and how to get access to them, whether they're open source or you can get 30-day trials, et cetera. Or on the right, you can check out some more blogs um, or case studies about the just embedded continuous integration in general and some specifics like getting started with fast models and uh, some specific information on the, benef the speed benefits you get from using fast models over physical hardware for unit testing. And that will wrap up our presentation of CI and embedded systems. So thank you for attending and we're here open for questions should you have them. So thank you very much.